I apologize for imposing my English on you, but uh, you would not want to hear my finish. <clears throat> when reflecting on a project meant to redefine the interaction of the public with the past, it seemed fleeting that I briefly redirect the focus of my remarks back to the audience. If I can therefore beg a moment's indulgence, I would like to ask you to try and summon a memory from this morning, from the instant when you first awoke, and attempt to capture that elusive impression in your mind. Now, try and answer this simple question. How did you know who you were when you first awoke? The answer, of course, is that your conception of self, your identity as an individual, is made up of all of your memories, whether they be vivid, half-remembered, or all but forgotten. Your past is what created the person who woke up this morning. In the same way, humankind's sense of self is made up of its cultural memory. Humankind's multitude of experiences throughout its long history have created what we think of as human culture and all of its wonderful and sometimes terrible diversity. And just as you would not be quite who you are now if you lost some of your most important memories, becoming an individual somehow lesser than the whole had been, humankind itself is made the poorer with each memory lost, with each human moment forgotten. Museums are, one might say, a means to explore such past worlds and experiences that now exist <clears throat> only if deliberately summoned from memory and preserved for the future. And even if we are painfully aware of how many of these memories humankind has lost throughout the ages, museums have a unique role to play in the restoration and communication of these lost moments of human cultural memory. And through the artifacts that are the signposts of these stories, to allow us to better understand the way of life that we have crafted for ourselves and our relationship with the material creations which have become an integral part of our modern way of life. Indeed, we need only return briefly to, the, to our original question to illustrate how our material creations have become enmeshed with our own sense of self. Thinking back to that defining, awakening moment, we likely sense that I awoke in my bed, in my room, surrounded by my things my immediate sense of self being interwoven with mat the material reality of the spaces and objects with which I have interacted. Some of us may have also shared this immediate experience with another person, creating an intimate instance of mutual comprehension at once a mirror of ourselves and a lens through which we incorporate other perspectives into our own. Our memory of self is then carried away by successive layers of these spaces and objects and people that moves outward from our private space to public places, across landscapes of diminishing familiarity and encompassing a broader memory of others. This intertwined landscape of the natural environment, built space, objects, and interpreted meaning makes up, to, makes up what I refer to as the human culture scape, the world we have fashioned for and of ourselves. Museums represent one of our most publicly accessible paths to exploring the culturescapes of the past. However, they are also culturescapes of their own, made up of recovered and reconstructed spaces and objects that have been given meaning by us as symbols of our shared history. The culturescapes of museums are also, unfortunately, not sites that are easily integrated into our daily lives. They are more akin to isolated temples of material culture that the public is most often drawn to from a vague sense of curious responsibility. They are destinations, the endpoints of journeys from which we hope to derive some measure of knowledge, understanding, and the sense of a necessary task publicly completed. In fact, if I might be forgiven an analogy, visiting museums might often be seen as an experience somewhat similar to visiting our grandparents' house when we were children. It is something we often do as part of a special trip that we should be properly dressed for and during which we should behave properly. We are often making our way through spaces that seem a bit too large and are full of things that are not part of our own lives, some of which may be interesting and some not, but all of which we are required to show immense respect for despite any lack of understanding. If we're lucky, we will get some food as part of the bargain, but in the end, everyone will at least enjoy a sense of having done the responsible thing, although we will have hopefully and reinforced, also reinforced our memories of a previous generation, which we may later find more valuable than we had realized. Now, no one is going to suggest that visiting your grandparents is a bad thing. 
However, I'm sure that we can all agree that integrating them into our daily lives in a more meaningful manner is a better way of encouraging lasting understanding. By making them less remote, they take on a more active role in our lives, and we are the richer for it. And so it is with museums and the popular understanding of the past. It is, I suspect, exactly what we might call this quality of remoteness that, the pro that this project was meant to contest by extending the culture scapes of museums into the spaces and places of everyday life and making the past a part of daily conversation. Rather than thinking of the project's humble carts as convenient containers for artifacts that had temporarily escaped the confines of the museum, I would rather see them as storytellers' booths, full of curious potential and mystery, and the volunteers as bards crafting their tales to their individual audiences. Each artifact has its own story, and each story is an invitation to learn more about the material past that is part of our immaterial memory of humankind. And it is my belief that we practitioners of the past, and here I include my own field of archaeology and all manner of historians and museologists, have, by taking up our callings, assumed a responsibility to strengthen that too often tenuous connection of the past with the present. This is a responsibility that passes beyond the narrow confines of professions and academia and can and should play a role in the public perception of the past. It is exactly through these types of activist public outreach projects that much good can be done towards the furthering of that cause. And in my experience, a partnership with community-oriented artists can often help us recognize new potential within our own fields for communicating our own perspectives. And it is important that we communicate those perspectives. For while we are right to be cautious of the potential abuse of academic opinion, we nevertheless cannot ignore the simple facts that public narratives of the past exist in plethora, and that they are most often misinformed or incomplete, and that they were equally often abused for social, economic, or political gain. Thus, while we may properly question the ability of any single field to provide a wholly balanced perspective on the past, we cannot doubt that our contribution would help to bring balance to an already imbalanced situation. And even apart from the less tangible benefits of studying the past, of encouraging the imagination to exceed the limits of the known now, an active and balanced appreciation of the past is more than ever a practical and necessary part of our future. For humankind is currently engaged in perhaps the most challenging endeavor in its history, learning how to manage the constant expansion, articulation, and integration of our global material culture. We are only now beginning to realize how perilous this experiment is, and the only responsible course open to us is to take every possible consideration into account as we plan our next steps. However, by firmly fixing our gaze on the future and asking only what can be done, we ignored the deepest source of understanding about what should be done, humankind's successes and failures in similar circumstances in the past. Unfortunately, as the public portrayal and use of the past by the media, business interests, and politicians constantly reminds us, the field of cultural history, as opposed to the manipulated and manufactured products of cultured history, has hardly played an influential role in this discourse. And while we may bemoan such developments within the confines of our own individual academic or professional disciplines, when we speak about such things as the differences between the academic interpretation of the past and the political or cultural identity of the past, what we are really speaking about is our failure to communicate a lasting meaning of the past to the broader public, which can be incorporated into their own lives and memories. Ultimately, the end result of this project will be measured in the individual lives it has touched, and the hope that, although the specific details of the stories may fade, it has encouraged the belief that the past can and should be a vital part of present-day life. My plea to both the public and we professionals alike, now that this would be, now that the story has begun to be told, let us not lose touch with that portion of ourselves that resides in the past, but rather reach out and embrace it and craft stories of our own to share as we can. Thank you.